how are you? For the past two weeks, we've been hosted by UMISA, last week by UMISA School of Business Leadership, have been toured around a number of the speakers. And during that two weeks, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about the culture. I have a lot more to learn. But one of the things that I learned from uh, a new dear friend, uh, Eric Malala at the School of Business Leadership, was a reconnection to something perhaps happening in the past. And what I learned was that some of my North American ways, the way that we treat people, have a tendency to ignore a lot of the aspects of humanity that we grew up with over thousands and thousands of years. So that I learned that here in South Africa, you don't come up to someone and say, excuse me, how do I get to the hotel? You say instead, oh, uh, hello, how are you? Because what you're doing is that you're recognizing their humanity. You're recognizing them as another person, as an equal. And that they respond and say, hello, how are you? And then, and only then, once you've recognized each other as fellow humans, can you say something like, could you perhaps help me? And we don't take it for granted, and we put each other on a very equal footing. And if there's one thing I'm going to take back from South Africa, is that, is I'm going to adopt one of your ways and try to do it myself in the future. Now, why am I talking about this? As we enter what I call the network era, is that we are seeing fundamental shifts in society, in our institutions, in the way in which we do business, and it is shaking the foundations of that. And one thing I want to talk about is that why are these things happening? How is that going to change what you are doing? And particularly, is that how is that changing our own understanding of what is leadership? And where does leadership fit in in a world like this? So if you think about society, if you think about humans, is that we've really only organized in three different ways. We started with in tribes and bands, and we organized that way for a long period of time. Then, probably a few thousand years ago, and it was different, in different on different continents in different areas, is that we started to create institutions. Our first institutions would have been monarchies, would have been priesthood based around religion, and would have been military organizations. We continued that way again for several thousand years until we started creating markets. Markets were required as we started trading with each other and our institutions and our nations were inadequate for that. And we are currently what's known as a triform society. A triform society is one that's based on tribes, institutions, and markets. We are moving into what David Ronfeld has called a quadriform society one based on tribes, institutions, markets, and networks, T-I-M-N. And right now, markets are dominating. And with each one of these, as we change from tribes to institutions to markets to networks, we don't lose the previous form. But the previous form is no longer dominant. You take a look as we move from tribes to and that we added institutions, we didn't lose the tribe. So that's why you can see on the bottom here, it's T plus I, T plus I plus M, and then moving into the N. And what I propose, taking a look at that, is that these shifts happened when we changed the way that we communicated. So the tribal societies, for the most part, were oral. Institutions came along, particularly if you look at the institution of religion and the three main religions that were based on books, right? So you have Christianity, uh, Judaism, and, uh, and Islam. And that things changed. On the Christian side, you read the, the Bible and it says in the beginning was the word. Things could be institutionalized. When we shifted the way that we communicated, we actually shifted the way in which our societies were organized. The same thing happened with the age of print, with Gutenberg's printing press in Europe, 
is that we started seeing significant shifts in markets. We started seeing trading happening. We started seeing the creation of uh, uh, trading companies, stock markets, the first stock exchanges in the Netherlands, in the United Kingdom. Things, things like Lloyd's of London developed out of that. And, so, and, and markets started to dominate. We are at the end of the age of market domination. We are moving into an age of network domination, and we don't have a clue what this is going to look like. But we're seeing signs of this everywhere. You t probably one of the most significant ones are the changes to the financial institutions around the world, where we see something like what's called blockchain technology, which is changing financial technology, uh, fintech as they call it. And the uh, recent manifestation of that is Bitcoin. So that w as we change those kinds of things, we move into the electric era. So this all started about 150 years ago with the invention of the telegraph and with the internet, all that's happening is that we are acceler accelerating the electrification of the way that we communicate. We are noticing it now because the internet is uh, uh, pushing that faster and faster. So what I propose is that we, in every aspect of our lives, are going to be shifting the way that we organize as a society. Examples of that, um, the, uh, uh, trying to remember the name of that, the, the Arab Spring, the Occupy Now movement. These are all experiments in how we organize as a network society. And that in networks, things are different. So what I propose is that two very key words here I, that, that, that I define very specifically, collaboration and cooperation. Collaboration is working together for a common purpose, is what most of us do in business. Usually requires a leader, someone in charge to set the agenda. Cooperation is where we share freely, with no quid pro quo, with no expectation of direct recompense. So I would cooperate if, again, I'm asking for directions to go somewhere, I give some, uh, and someone gives me the directions, they don't expect me to pay them. We cooperate in many ways. And if you take a look at the TIMN model and you look at the way in which influence and power were exerted in tribes, kinship, it was who you were related to, right, was the way in which you had your power, your families, the connections. We, these were relatively small scale. Then as we moved into institutions dominating, it was where you were in the hierarchy. And I know that none of you work in hierarchical organizations, so you wouldn't understand that. However, if for the few of us who, have, who work in the, in, in the market sector, is that it's, what's important is competition. Your power is if you're the most competitive. You're the first to market. You're the fastest to market. Right? We're seeing this. We're still dominated by those, um, by those ideas. Right? But as we move into the network era, it's reputation that we are going to get by cooperating that is actually going to uh, pr provide us with in more, more influence than power. So the people who have the better, better reputation are the ones who are going to be able to influence better in a network economy, in a network environment, in a network business. Now, this was said to me in 2004. I presume you can all read it. Now, I don't know if anybody knows who Andrea Wilson is. Uh, she's very, very influential. Um, as far as I'm concerned in my, in, in my life. We've been married for 25 years now. <laughs> so I found myself unemployed in 2003, and I started writing a blog because I thought that was a good thing, and I thought I needed to connect with the world. I thought that I live far away. I live in eastern Canada. I'm 1,000 kilometers from the nearest major center, either Montreal or Boston in the United States. Uh, there was very little work. I live in a relatively high unemployment and no one looking for someone with my skills. And I started writing a blog. And my wife was saying this, I mean, we were living a little hand to mouth at the time. I had two uh, young children at home, um, lots of debt from previous things. And I was writing my blog and I was connecting with people, some people who are here who I've known for a good uh, 10, 12 years. And this is, what, this is what my wife said to me. She said, you're putting all this stuff out there. Right? They're going to get your stuff for free. And how are, we gonna, how are you going to earn a living? How are you going to feed your family? It's not going to work. 
And today in 2015, I am here speaking to you at the International Conference on Open and Distance Education, flown in from Canada to South Africa. Right? How did I get here? My blog. Right? The reason that you know me is through my blog. I think that I'm an early example of how you can use, you can build a reputation by giving to the network, and in return the network gives back to you, but you don't have a clue how that's going to happen. Right? It gives back very indirectly. If you, it's almost, a, and it was a leap of faith, and I can tell you we've had some pretty hard times over the last uh, 12 years. Um, but as time has gone on, I've continued to work, I've continued to connect with people, I've continued to publish online, and as I wrote several years ago, my blog has given me everything, all right? My network has given me everything, the world has given me everything, because I connected, I engaged with the world, and my fellow humans gave back. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, a Canadian, he's fairly famous, uh, Marshall McLuhan. Um, Marshall McLuhan and Harold Innes uh, ran what's, what is now known as the Toronto School at the University of Toronto, talked about communication, and uh, Marshall McLuhan is famous. He was mentioned, I think, um, uh, earlier uh, by Tressy, um, with uh, things like the global village, um, and the medium is the message, and for all of the people who are looking at that, yes, that is a typo. It says the medium is the massage. And that, the first copy of that book actually came out with that title, and McLuhan loved it. Because ba his basic premise was that the way that we communicate actually influences the way that we think, right? So the medium is the message. The medium of the web the medium of the networks, those four main media that we had from oral to written to print to electric are changing the way that we think, are changing the way that we communicate, are changing what's becoming important, right? And uh, the, uh, McLuhan with his son Eric wrote uh, back in, in, in the 1980s a book that was called The Laws of Media. And basically the laws of media you see up on the right hand corner here is that every technology has four effects on people. It extends some aspect of the human condition. It obsolesces something, quite often turning it into a luxury product. It retrieves something from the past. And when pushed to its, uh, as far as possible, it actually reverses the original intent. So if you take a look at um, automobiles, automobiles extended human mobility. They extended the human foot. They obsolesced the horse and carriage and horses. Horses now become a luxury item only owned by the rich, right? It retrieves from the past. It retrieves the aspect of the knight in shining armor. And as someone who doesn't own a car and, and rides a bicycle, I know what it's like dealing with these knights in shining armor on the street. And, when, and it reverses its original intent. It gave all of us mobility until everybody got a car and we got gridlock. So this happens with every single, and this is a lens by which we can analyze the technologies that are affecting us, and this is a tool. The book McLuhan for Managers actually covers this and provides specific techniques on how to use it. So if we take a look at the network era, digital networks, what do they do? They extend productivity. No, individuals have incredible productivity now. We have personal computers, we have spreadsheets, we, have the, we, we can plug into stuff, we can get things done very, very quickly, much more effective. An individual now, uh, or even a small team, can do incredible things. And we're seeing that you know, from the much maligned uh, uh, Silicon Valley. They're getting a lot done, and they're not employing a lot of people. Right? It obsolesces industrial labor, right? The, what we, the, the being productive is not as important as being creative. It retrieves from the past artisanal work, the artisans, individuals being craftsmen, craftsmen of, of, of knowledge. And when pushed to its extent, it can create what's called a panopticon. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the panopticon, but it was this um, uh, prison that was designed uh, and thankfully never built until the internet era, in which the uh, jailers could see the prisoners, but the prisoners could never see the jailers. So you never knew if you were being watched, therefore you were always being watched. Now we have the NSA. 
so what about education? If we use the laws of media on education, you look at digital networks, they're extending individual learning. Anybody can learn anywhere, anytime, if they have the connectivity, the skills, the motivation. But it really has opened up a wide world. It obsolesces the academy. So the academy, which dominated since the time of Plato, right, is now being put in question by distributed networks, open education resources. It retrieves the age of discourse that Socrates was the major proponent of. And now we're coming back to more discourse between people, people connecting on Facebook, people connecting on Twitter. You get discourse happening all over. That whole notion of conversation not mediated by an expert. And what does it reverse into? Actually, what we're seeing is that with platform capitalism, where you have large platforms that control everything, is actually fewer choices, which is a, which, which is a uh, potential problem that we're going to be facing. So I would also put forward that as we move into the network era, work is changing. So if you look back in the past is that all, in the industrial information economy is that there was more routine work than non-standardized work. You know you have that because we have protocols, processes, routines, and things like that. As we move into the network era, there's much less routine work because it's getting automated and much more uh, non-standardized work. That's where the value is. So what we're seeing is a shifting in value from routine work to non-standardized work as we move into a creative networked economy you can see on the right-hand side. And what does that mean? That means that the knowledge we need to be able to do that type of work moves from explicit, codified books and manuals to implicit understanding how to negotiate the current situation, talking to your peers, and finding out what's going on currently. It changes learning. The learning that we need is just in time. The learning that we need is um, uh, very, very specific to our, our current context. And much more of the learning that we require to do our work is actually informal. And then finally, the value that we're creating, instead of building widgets, we're now creating ideas. We're now creating algorithms. You look at the big companies around the world, you look at Google. What's Google based on? Zeros and ones. You know, they have an algorithm. Right? It's not based upon how much land they own. It's not based upon how, much, um, um, how many things they have ready to ship. It's based on an idea. And if somebody came up with a better algorithm, that intangible value could disappear. So intangible value is much more volatile. So what we're seeing is what I call, we're seeing a decrease in the value of labor, which Gary Hamill describes as um, uh, uh, obedience, diligence, and intelligence, the requirements of the old workforce. We're seeing that as getting, if it's not getting automated, it's getting outsourced. Ben Hammersley in the UK said that anything that can be put into a flow chart will be automated. So if your job or anything that you're doing, we see it in North America, I don't know how it is here, is that if you go for a mortgage uh, to buy a house, you don't have to talk to a person. You just, your, your data gets entered in and then the machine decides whether you get the money or not. Right? That used, we used to have mortgage officers and things like that that did that. That's getting automated. And if it's not getting automated, it may get outsourced to somebody who can do it a lot cheaper in a different country. And that's a temporary measure. We're moving into this non-standardized creative work dominating in the workplace. So we're seeing an increasing demand for initiative, creativity, passion. This is what Gary Hamill identified. And empathy. Empathy, which uh, uh, Joyce had mentioned uh, yesterday, I think is becoming a critical skill. Right? Because as the machines are handling all the routine stuff, we have to focus on the people side. Um, Marina Gorbis of the Institute for the Future in, uh, wrote a recent book, and it looked at what doctors do and nurses do. And what may happen in 20 or 30 years is that doctors may become redundant as they're automated. Who needs a surgeon when you have a good robot? But nursing skills may become more and more in demand. So we may actually see nurses dominating the healthcare field sometime in the future. This right here, it's a little bit complicated. I'm going to run through it fairly. Take a look at the bottom left-hand side. This is, you can see along the scale here, is that this is goal-oriented and collaborative work. It's where most of us do our work, right? We are sharing complex knowledge. It's deadline-driven. And we have st some kind of social ties with the people that we work with. This is where a lot of work gets done and it will continue to get done. And if you go to the, 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 the top right, 
in our professional social networks, and many of us are out there, whether it's on Twitter or whether it's in a, a, a private thing, and out there we have these weak social ties. I have weak social ties with a number of you and a number of people all over the world, some who may be listening to the stream right now. And there you get a diversity of ideas, opinions, and perspectives. And we need to have both of those, the weak social ties and the strong social ties, and we need to have uh, uh, different links. Because we're dealing with more and more complex ideas, com wicked problems, as was discussed um, uh, yesterday. So to deal with those wicked problems, we need, to be, we need to be outside and inside. And there's this really sweet spot in the middle, communities of practice. These are safe places in which we can experiment with new ideas. And these are places in which you know, they're trusted, we have a mix of ties, we have an affinity, and um, my definition of a community of practice is that you know that you are in a community of practice if it changes your practice. And w more and more of our work is going to be negotiating these three spaces continuously. We're going to be getting new ideas, we're going to be filtering them, we're going to be doing work, and we're going to be putting those, those ideas back on, into our communities. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be working out loud and learning out loud. And these, I think, are critical skills for anyone who's going to be providing value, doing valuable work, helping their society in the network era. So connecting all three of those spaces. And one way that I think that we can do that is through a discipline of mindfulness. Now, this is a, this is a, a framework that I've developed, personal knowledge mastery. Um, you can Google it and find out lots more about it. But basically what it is, if you take a look at this circle here, it's a process of continuously breathing in and breathing out. So you're breathing in from your network. You're seeking a diversity of opinions. You're looking for different ideas. You're collecting information digitally, analog as well. You're then filtering that and you're working through your communities of practice with your new ideas, right? You say, hey, let's try this thing out. What do you think of that? And then you're getting work done within your teams who are continuously have to improve and change as the context is constantly changing in this very networked, volatile, intangible era. And then you're breathing out by discerning where, with whom, and how to share. So, this, so it really is a sense of mindfulness of negotiating this digital communicative space, right? Where nobody's in charge, the experts are kind of all over the place, and how do we make sense of that? And I think this type of a skill becomes a foundational skill for anyone who wants to stay in control of their professional development. This model currently is used at some universities where they're helping prepare the students so that when they leave, they already have an external professional network. So if you look at the sharing and the sense making, and you can see that if you are low in both of those, you're a consumer. And some people who share a lot are good connectors. And many of you are experts. But in the network era, leadership requires knowledge catalysts. Those are people who are not just high sense making, but are high sharing because they're giving back to the network. They are making the network more resilient. They're helping the network make better decisions. And that is the role of leaders anywhere in whatever network it is that you're working. And that's, it's difficult, it's possible, and I think that that's where most people have to be focusing their attention. So how do you become a knowledge catalyst? You look here, help the network make better decisions. Various, so what, initiating change. What does that mean? That means that you can't just do your job. It means that you actually have to be out there experimenting. Now, in complex environments, there's a lot of research that shows that the only way you can understand a complex system is by actually engaging with it, right? You can't sit and analyze it and analyze it. Google uh, Mail, the Gmail application, is a good example. Google didn't have a clue what would happen when you had hundreds of millions of people on a web mail system. So what did they do? They didn't wait and analyze. They launched a, a, a beta project. It was called Gmail, and there was a little beta sign um, uh, under it for probably up until uh, a year or two ago. Right? Because they knew that they couldn't really fix what it was until they knew, until they were at scale, 
and they knew that they wouldn't get to scale until, unless they tried to do something. So the whole notion of initiating change is something that has to be embedded in your organization, right? Change is, it's not like how to, change is not something, or change management is not something that you prepare for, you do, and, and then it's done, and then you wait for the next change. Change is this continuous process, right? So the job of leaders in networks is to actually initiate that change. Dave Snowden, who developed the Kinevin framework around, uh, around complexity, says that what we need to do is that we need to launch what are called safe to fail projects, right? That means that the project is, we're going to do it, and it's okay if we fail. Well, that means that it has to be small enough, right, that if it fails, we're not going to take down the whole organization. It also means that we have to have lots of them. Dave said that if we don't, um, is it, the only way we can learn is if we have enough failure. So I was talking to him a couple of years ago and I asked him, so like how much failure do we have to have? He said, if, your pro if, 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 if less than 50% of your projects uh, fail, you're not trying hard enough. Now how many people in your organizations are allowed to fail 50% of the time or more? This is the new reality. And this is why Silicon v Valley is eating people's lunch. Because they actually, they have the mentality and the culture of failure. There are some venture capitalists who will not put money into your company until you failed a couple of times first. Like, yeah, you know, I, so, I mean, so they're invested, they know that you've actually learned something from your failure. Le leaders and networks learn by doing. You don't learn from the books, you actually learn by doing things. And it's through that doing. They add value to knowledge, right? They see things that are happening and they, and, and, and they say, look, this is interesting. Instead of coming from a conference like this and taking the conference proceeding, proceedings and putting it into the library, what do they do? They write a post or they give a presentation to, their local, to, to the folks that they're working with and they say, this is what I learned at ICDE 2015. How many of you with the notes that you're taking are actually going to disseminate them? How many are going to share them? How many are going to provide the insights? That is what digital network connected leaders do. They engage through conversation. The sharing of implicit knowledge can only be done through conversation. You think about it, look at chefs, right? I can buy a recipe book and I can, written by the most famous chef in the world, and I can probably prepare a meal just as well as that chef, right? Well, I can't, that's the explicit codified knowledge, right? But the chef who has the practice and the experience can, can prepare a wonderful meal, right? Much better than anything that I could do, right? And the only way that they learned that was informally through experience and they have the implicit knowledge. The only way that knowledge can be shared and it takes time, it's, it, 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 it's messy, it requires um, social relationships, it requires commitment, is through conversation. We connect people. We do what, what, what I call network weaving, right? So we go from, uh, so I know one person, I know that person, and I know that those two people actually um, are interested in the same thing. So instead of me being the bottleneck for those two people, what I do is I connect the two of them together and I do what's called closing the triangle or network weaving. And now they don't need me anymore. I've created a new connection and I've made the network stronger. And then also share expectations. Talk about, you know, I'm concerned about these things. I don't know what's going to happen next. This is what network leaders do. They help the network make better decisions, right? If you have a problem, ask your network. Let the network do the work for you, as Dion Hinchcliffe says. So what's happening today in the network era, as hyperlinks subvert hierarchy, as the clue train said in 1999, is that Whereas work and education were kind of separate, you did the learning, you did the work, you went back and did some learning, is it today, tomorrow, is that work is learning and learning is the work. And in an age where work is learning and learning is the work, leadership is learning. Leadership is helping learning and it's helping people to connect. So, back to McLuhan. So what's happening? Extending individual learning. Frameworks like personal knowledge mastery, that's required. We're obsolescing the academy and only the rich are going there. The 1% are the ones who are, you know, Harvard is not going to go out of business, right? We're retrieving discourse through social media, but 
the potential is that we're reversing into fewer choices with only corporate MOOCs and platforms run by the platform capitalists to tell us what the real knowledge is. So those are, there's a, red is the dystopian future, yellow is where we should be focusing as well as uh, on, 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 on the green. So this is what we should be looking at. What kind of frameworks can we have to help people make sense of this emerging network era? I love these cartoons. I hope this one makes sense. Thank you. <laughs>